Let's sing this together. The King of Glory, from whom all blessings flow. Sing, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart, my soul, my soul. Don't give up, there is hope. There is always hope And there is peace in the storm In the storm No, don't forget He is Lord He is Lord of all Let's sing it out! There's a king! for you today and just continue the prayer of that song that you Holy Spirit would renew our strength Lord we sit in many ways today at the end of one week and at the beginning of a new week we've come into this place Lord for you to do what your plans are so please Father just hear us. We offer praise to you, thanksgiving to you. We worship you and your greatness and goodness. You've blessed us in amazing ways, ways that we're aware of and ways that we don't even know. 
Father, I pray um, today as we open your word that um, what you had planned in preserving this word to this day would be accomplished. Let us hear from you. Convict us where we're wrong. Give us courage and give us clarity and understanding of your word. Shape us and mold us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness, faithfulness. We pray, Father, that um, today any person in this room never trusted you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day they'd call out to you and be saved. Thank you for the testimony of these that have been baptized today, proclaiming their faith publicly. And we pray, Lord, every week we'd have the joy of seeing the fruit of the work you're doing in that way. We love you. Let's make this time count for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. I know a little bit about what's coming in the next hour, and we'll begin that hour with baptism as well. I think about the two uh, senior girls baptized this morning. The next hour, there'll be two from children's uh, area that Scott will be baptizing, and then I'll baptize a guy. Uh, Colquitt Slover is a teacher at, middle, at uh, Malcolm Bridge Middle School and look forward to those baptisms in the next hour as well. Today we continue our uh, study in a series of messages called Good to Know. And we began that last week and we um, are talking about things in our life and times in our life where we might find ourselves saying it's good to know. I would imagine just kind of a, a casual look back over the last week that at least a dozen times I've either spoken or someone has said to me, that's good to know. Uh, a couple of times I think I heard somebody say, uh, it would have been nice if I had known. Uh, some of those things are not very important, are they? We use that phrase a lot and we say, that's good to know and it's not that big a deal, I think. Uh, today, I f found out that uh, the lipstick sell, get two for one, ends Friday. And you might say that's good to know. Uh, it, that, that's not that big a deal. Some of you are thinking, that's a really big deal. Where's that, where's that uh, deal? Uh, I don't wear lipstick, but I bought a lot in uh, my life with two daughters and a wife. Uh, but usually not that big a deal. Uh, but... You know, if somebody walks up to the table and you're sitting there and your tongue is tingling and your lips are swelling and you ask the person there, does this pie have almond flavoring in it? I'm allergic to nuts. I may die in your restaurant right now. Uh, it's pretty important. You might say it would have been good to know that ahead of time. There are a lot of things in our life that because of relationships and interaction in this life and the fact that eternity hangs in the balance for us, that things that are good to know can be very, very important. Maybe you have a decision to make and you would say it would be good to know what God's will is for this decision. Maybe you've been given a diagnosis of a terminal illness and you would say it would be good to know what will happen when I die. You may have a roommate that's asking you questions about gender identity issues. And you would say, it'd be good to know how to address that with my roommate. You may have a son that's saying, I don't know why there's a reason to live. And you'd say, it'd be good to know how to respond to someone about their purpose in life. You may be weighing curriculum for a third grade class. And you would say, it'd be good to know what kind of foundation we should be building on when we're teaching our children. There are a lot of things that we would say, these are very important and it would be good to know. And that's the hope over these weeks. We're going to talk about knowing God's will and how 
Uh, we can know what God's will is for our life. We're going to talk about what happens when we die. We're going to talk about how to resist temptation. Uh, we spoke last week with what I believe is critical at the very beginning for any issue that comes up that it's good to know that the Bible is the Word of God and it can be trusted. And so that is the beginning of this series. In a lot of ways, these weeks are systematic. Uh, one message builds upon another. If you were not here last week, I would encourage you to go find the message online at watkinsville.org and, and listen there and just kind of track. If you miss a week somewhere out there this fall, uh, go there and, and listen to the message because it's, it's kind of like systematic theology. It's, it's kind of like a primer for Christian living. It is us saying kind of just each step of the way, one thing building on another, this is good to know. This will help me as I live this life and face eternity. Last week, it's so critical for us, I just would mention to you, I gave you nine reasons that the Bible is God's word and can be trusted. And I just mentioned these to have that just kind of hovering over the room uh, too fast to write it down. But we believe that the Bible is God's word and can be trusted at least for these reasons because of the Bible's claims about itself, because of the claims of Jesus, the one who never did any wrong, the one who faced death and was buried and rose back to life. He conquered the greatest enemy of this life, the claims of Jesus. God's word can be trusted. Number three, the durability of the word. We're not talking about last year's best seller. We're talking about the Word of God that is durable across time. The Word of God can be trusted because of the impact we see of the Word on the lives of people. The Word can be trusted because of the accuracy of the Word. And thinking specifically the, the accuracy of God's Word when it comes to both science and history. We can trust the Word because of how the book reads us and so many times you'll find that when you're reading God's word we're not exactly reading God's word as much as the word is reading us and we think the word we believe the word can be trusted because of the unity of the Bible I, I just I still it's it's one of these things that's just gotten in my heart again this year it's been so exciting to just kind of refresh about the power of the unity of the word 66 books of the bible written over 1500 years by 40 different authors in three different languages on three different continents and that word is unified in every way old testament to new testament there is one message and that is the message of redemption and Adrian Rogers said there's one hero and that's Jesus and there's one enemy and that's the devil and there's one purpose and that's the glory of the God. That's the unity of that book we call the Bible. And then there is number eight, fulfilled prophecy. Hundreds upon hundreds of prophecies spoken many years before those prophecies before those events only to see them fulfilled again and again and again and then number nine grouped with all of this is what I call just generational discipleship and that is the people that I have trusted in my life have believed the book and just generation, generationally that's been passed down showing me the trustworthiness of God's word now here's the sequence the sequence is the Bible is God's word and can be trusted. And if we believe that the Bible is God's word and can be trusted, the next thing we should say is what? What does the word say? What does the word say? And what we find out and where we go to to find out what God's word says is the very first page of the very first book in the very first chapter of God's Word. So let's turn there. Let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses here 
And today I want to speak to you on the topic, it's good to know God created us in his image. It is good to know that God created us in his image. And when you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, believing that it is God's word, where we have that put to the test at the very beginning. And the very first verse, the very first phrase, Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. A summary verse that talks about uh, the this, this state of things here in the beginning, and that phrase in the beginning God created and the and the truth is is that if we can come to that verse and believe that verse then the rest of the Bible is set on its course to believe what God has said has done and is doing in the beginning God created today I want to build the argument that God has uniquely created us God has uniquely created you. God has uniquely created humanity. And when we use the word unique, I mean it in the truest sense. Only the, when you use the word unique, we're talking about the only one of its kind. It's unlike anything else. And according to God's word, that is true and trustworthy. God's word teaches that humanity has been uniquely created by him. This unique creation of us is demonstrated in, number one, the fact that he uniquely celebrates us. You're taking notes. You want to just organize the message in your mind. This is point one. Under the phrase, God has uniquely created us. This unique creation of us is demonstrated in that he has uniquely celebrated us. Look at Genesis chapter 1. We read this opening verse. And then as you walk through Genesis chapter 1, you see the sequence of creation. And one of the uh, helpful things in, in reading God's word is maybe to, to, to mark it there and show some things. And over time, at some point, I just went through Genesis 1 and circled first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. I don't know how you would choose. Maybe you have a, a four or five different highlight, highlighter colors you use to mark different things. But uh, I circle that and I see that on the first day, God said, let there be light. And then on the second day, he created the heavens. And then you see on the third day that the, he said, let the earth sprout vegetation. And then on the fourth day, he said, let there be lights. And then on the fifth day, he said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. And so you see that he created the things that fly in the air and the things that swim in the water on the fifth day. And then on the sixth day, on the sixth day, he created, it says in verse 24, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. When I read that verse, it lets us know that it was on the sixth day that God created things like cows, and horses, livestock. Now, he also said that he created on the sixth day creeping things. I'll talk to God about that in heaven when we get there. There are very few things in the world that I would describe as creeping things that I celebrate. Um, but he did it, and he knows best. And beasts of the earth, according to their kinds, and we can think about things that we would describe as beast. He said, 
in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Listen to verse 27. He restates it. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant and every green plant for food and it was so and God said everything and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day now chapter 2 tells us about the seventh day where God rested now this morning's message is not uh, meant to uh, explain creation or to argue about creation I'm coming to God's word this morning for the narrow purposes of this message not to talk about old earth and new earth or the gap theory or intelligent design I'm just coming to God's word today and saying I believe that the Bible is true and trustworthy and what the Bible tells me is that God created me God created humanity and when you look at these verses how what did what did he do in that creation he uniquely created humanity it's unique in the way he celebrates humanity so what do you mean pastor notice the sequence the sequence first day second day third day fourth day fifth day he's he's creating all of these things and the very last thing you can see the the building of of God's work and the celebration of of putting things together on this earth till he comes down to a point to where he said and let us make man in our image after our likeness and so you see a celebration of the creation of humanity in the sequence of the last thing that he did on that week before he rested you also see this unique celebration of humanity in the way that, that God spoke about creation. There was, there was never a time, like on, in uh, verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1, where it says, And God said, Let there be light. And so there was light, which God, in response to the fact that God said, Let there be light, therefore on that day there was light. It was different. When it came time for God to speak about this creation of humanity three times over in verse 27, you see this phrase, so God created in the image of God, he created male and female, he created. Some studiers of God's word actually tie this uh, th three times over statement of God's creating of humanity to God being described as thrice holy. And as God is uh, seen as holy, 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 our understanding of humanity is created, created, created. And you see the handiwork on display of a holy God and it's described and declared three times over just in this time but then in chapter 2 again the more details of creation is given how the man was created out of the dust and later in chapter 2 how the woman was taken from man and created no other part of creation no other part of creation is celebrated in this way that God celebrates the creation of humanity so this unique creation of us is demonstrated in the unique celebration of God's creation of humanity number two the unique 
creation of us by God is not only uniquely celebrated, it is uniquely connected. Our creation is uniquely created to God. Uniquely created to God. Our creation, according to God's word, reflects who he is and tells us more about who we are. There's a unique connection that's not said about the beast of the earth or a unique connection that's not said about creeping things. There's a unique connection that's not said about plants or trees. And just, just understand, let your mind work here and think about, okay, what you're saying is, is even though there are living things that we call beast or fish or creeping things, that there is something different between those living things and me as a living thing. Absolutely. Without question. And it is because of our unique connection to God. And it's this phrase in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. Back in verse 26, he's already said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now this idea of us being created in the image and likeness of God is not isolated to just verse 27. It occurs again in Genesis Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 8. In Genesis chapter 8 where it talks about actually uh, laws uh, about murder and, and murder being wrong. It is tied to the fact that, that man is created in the image of God. And if you look through God's word, you'll find at least a hundred verses that are tied to this idea and picture of humanity being created in the image of God. Now the question that continues to be studied and, and prayed through and thought through is in what way do we bear the image and likeness of God? For our purposes this morning, I would offer to you that there are four ways that humanity reflects or is connected to God through creation. And those four ways that we are uniquely connected to God is that we are in his image and in his likeness rational people. And number two, that we are creative people. And number three, that we are moral people. And number four, that we are immortal so rational, creative, moral, immortal. What do we mean by that? We mean that across humanity, that when you talk about humanity that God has created, that humanity has the ability to weigh things out. We are rational people. Now, certainly there are moments in our life where we would argue that. And we may say to someone, you're not being rational. But we would say to somebody, you're not being rational because there's an expectation that they have the ability to be rational. And, and it's not, uh, it, it, it is the ability to weigh things out. It's, it's one of the things that distinguishes us between uh, our dog. Pastor, are you really going to go there this morning? Man, that's, that's dangerous, isn't it? It's what, let's do it, let's, you know, would it be safer for me to say it's what distinguishes us between our cats? You know, maybe that would be, for some in the room, that's still hard to hear. But the, there's a difference between animal instinct and human rationality. And animals may do things based on instinct. But humanity is like God in that we're able to weigh things out. We're able to put things together and add things up and take things away and come up with a solution or solve a problem. There's never a time where my dog has looked at me and I've fed him early in the morning before the sun came up and, and any time where my dog would be thinking, I'm going to eat part of this now and then I'm going to come back after lunch and eat the rest of it because he's not going to be home the rest of the day (laughs) 
we are rational. A second way that we see this connection to God is that we are creative. We come up with things. It's different than animals. Animals have instincts. They have habitats they build. But you'll never go home and My dog's never hung wallpaper in his doghouse, all right? <laughs> he's, he's not creative. It's, it, he does the same thing over and over again. We're creative people. We reflect the creator. We, we come up with things. We have colors that we like and taste, and, and we, we can, we, we'll come up with new recipes. We, we, we come up with new designs. We have all different kinds of houses, and we love to change and move those things. It, we're creative. It's just it's, it, it's a reflection of the creative image of God. Number three is moral. We, we often refer to this as consciousness. We, we expect in our world as we relate to people that there would be a sense of, conscious, of, of having a, a, a conscience. Now, it can be damaged and it can be seared. But we have laws because we believe that we can tell people what's right and wrong. And there is a sense in humanity of what's right and wrong. I was thinking this week about um, growing up days and fights that we would have at our school. And I, maybe this is just local to the town that we grew up in or maybe, I don't, I don't know, Maybe it's universal. But it was just th this sense. I, I remember this uh, kind of the, uh, the description of, um, of fighting. We're good. We'll be all right. Um, and the guy would say, wanting to fight, would say, meet me at the water tower after school. Is that universal? Or is that just North Alabama? I don't know. <laughs> just meet me at the water tower after school. We'll settle this. And I always thought, here's a guy that wants to fight. He wants to black your eye. He wants to knock you out. But he has something in him that says, this really isn't the spot to do it. There's class going on. And so we'll wait till school is out and we'll go to a place that's the right place to fight. What is that? It's a, it's a moral sense of some things are right or some things are wrong. We're uniquely connected, rational, creative, moral, number four, immortal. And that is, as the word says, two things last forever, the word of God and the souls of man. And we have a soul that will last forever. We're uniquely connected to God. Number three, we're uniquely created by God as seen in a celebration of his creation, the connectedness to God. And number three, he has uniquely commanded us. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Now, he said to the plants uh, earlier, uh, he, he said to the things swimming in the sea, he said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures, let the birds fly. Uh, later, he says, God said it was good. He blessed them. He says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. But the difference in the uniquely being commanded is when God said be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth he goes on with a new command and he says subdue it and have dominion over and you see the unique creation of God of humanity is that he's uniquely commanded humanity to subdue the earth and to rule over the earth and then in chapter 2 verse 15 and 17 he says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. 
And you, you see that he uniquely commands humanity. And he sets out, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. And, and you see that this in, in creation, God who's created us in his image and his likeness has also commanded us. He's given us uh, boundaries in which to live. I won't say a lot about this, but you also see in these verses that this unique creation is demonstrated in how God has uniquely companioned us. And that is that he looked at man, he said it's not good for man to be alone. And he created a woman and brought her to him. And it is a, it is a, a picture of creation that we are built for relationship. It's not a teaching that every person is supposed to be married you have God's word you take the whole counsel of God's word the New Testament especially speaks of, of that there would be uh, full purposeful living life without there being a husband wife relationship but it does show to us that God created us with a sense of relationship it's not good to be alone he's built us to have relationship we're uniquely companioned now, I want to bring this to a close talking about the ramifications of this unique creation. If God has celebrated humanity and he's connected us through creating us in his image and his likeness. If God has commanded us, what does that mean? What does that mean for us? Three things. Number one, it explains the value of all humanity. It explains the value of all humanity. When God says he created us in the likeness, in his likeness and in his image, he created us male and female, it, 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 you see that there is an equal value and worth in all of humanity. It explains this value of all humanity, whether male or female, created in the image of God from conception to death. Humanity created in the image of God. All stages and all seasons, whether you're lost without Jesus Christ or you're saved with Jesus Christ, value. It's why you and I would treat people in equal ways. It's why when we're confronted with racism that we go to the fact that humanity was created in the image of God. It's why when we face issues such as abortion that we build our values based on the fact that humanity, all humanity, as Psalm 139 says, has been created by God, knit together by God in the mother's womb. It explains the value of all humanity. It's why when you hear someone say we're going to um, if we find out a particular person is going to suffer with this we're going to we're going to just kind of slice just slice that out just get that out of life's culture what we ought to be saying is what does this person created by God, where's their value? Their value is not in a utilitarian view of what they can offer to society. Their value is found in the fact that they have a creator whose name is God who created them in his image and likeness. And number two, it expresses a distinct design for humanity. In the very beginning, his design of humanity is that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. And number three, it establishes the purpose of humanity. It establishes the purpose of humanity. And the purpose of humanity is to do what every created thing does, and that is to reflect the glory of the created one. And, and when we are looking for purpose and we're looking for meaning in life, we find our purpose, we find our meaning in life at looking at who created me and how do I reflect their glory? How do I accomplish what their 
goal and purpose is for my life. And you find throughout God's word that we exist to bring him glory. It's why the theory of evolution and Darwinian's theory of creation is so uh, tragic for society and culture. Because if you have a view that we all just evolved and we have no creator, then we have no purpose. We, we, we're, it's just survival. It's just see what comes up next. Even atheists know this. Bertrand Russell, an atheist, said, unless you assume a God, the question of life's purpose is meaningless. Now, you know how it is when you see things that are created. You observe things and you know them and you know what they look like. It reflects a certain thing. You think about uh, things that are made by apple and you see the design and you can tell you can pick out the design and say I know who made that you can look at cars and you can look at them and say I, I, I know that design that reflects on the maker we go to a lot of weddings and a lot of weddings we walk through and, 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 and I walk by the cake table and I've been in Athens long enough now to walk by a table and say oh that's a Cecilia's cake <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, it may be strawberry, it may be chocolate, it may be lemon, all different kinds, but I know that it's a Cecilia's cake. And in our life, we may look different and act different and have different preferences and different tastes. The purpose for our life is to reflect our Creator. Now, I want to bring this to a close by acknowledging the fact that all humanity is created in the image of God and valuable in God's eyes and should be shown value by our actions. We have at the same time been uniquely corrupted. And chapter 3 of Genesis tells about the fall and how we sin and we disobey God. And you tra trace through Scripture, you see how that sin nature is passed down and that's why the Bible becomes this redemption story with Jesus as the hero who faced death, bore sin, died to pay for sin and satisfy the wrath of God, rose back to life guaranteeing who he is and assuring us that we too can live for eternity. The Bible becomes that story of good news because of the bad news of Genesis chapter 3 and next week we will talk about that it's good to know we have an enemy and that every sin is a win in his eyes but this morning I'd ask you to bow with me and just think for a moment heads bowed and what are the ramifications for you personally believing that God's word is true Believing that God's word teaches us that we are created in the image of God with value designed by him to bring him glory. Is there some value in your life that needs to shift, that needs to change, that the Holy Spirit would convict and say, you're missing it right there. And you'd invite the wisdom of God to just flood your heart. Show and shape, transform. To be lined up with what God says about life. Maybe today you realize that you've sinned and you need that Savior. You need Jesus. Would you call out to him today to forgive you and save you? Lord, would you help us today just in so many ways, just a, a beginning place of how you're our creator. This is, you're our creator and designer. Lord, would you help us as we live with this knowledge to honor you 
in our relationship with you and in our relationships with all of life. In Jesus' name.